What's up, everybody? What's up, everyone? Long time no see. Yo, homies. <laughs> <laughs> Long time no see. You know what's funny? I was watching you uh, finish your stream, and I could get the end of what you were saying because that <laughs> animation into it. It was great. Yeah, I was on a Zoom call with Marone for the past few minutes, and I was totally doing the, like, the this movement is my, like, about to sign off. Don't go anywhere. Yeah, I was noticing it, too. I was like, okay, I think she's about to sign off. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. So for any of you new to the show, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh. Any veterans of the show, welcome back. What are we going to get into today, Maroon? Today we got a lot. I know everyone's been talking about uh, uh, the Epic Games lawsuit, which now includes Apple and Google. Definitely be touching on that, as well as Sam Fisher crossing over to Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, there's Star Citizen News. That is right. Also going to be talking about the, uh, there's an update from Remedy on their multiplayer game Vanguard, as well as uh, uh, unspoken titles. Uh, the devs will talk PS5 and Xbox Series X difficulties with scaling back games for previous gen. Really interesting conversation once we dive into that. Also, Fall Guys is going to have some free content. So for all you Fall Guys players, now for that. And then we'll discuss some um, AC Valhalla as there's going to be a graphic novel that's going to you know bring on more of that backstory. Yeah, so let's dive into the first topic for the day, as I know, we're big fans of Fisher, and knowing yes. that Sam is making the jump over to Operation Shadow Legacy. So, chat, did you miss, do you miss the Splinter Cell franchise as much as we do? Because we talk about it a lot on the show. And if so, you'll be glad to know that Sam Fisher will be back, but not in a new game quite yet. Sam Fisher, the hero of Ubisoft's dormant Splinter Cell franchise will soon join the Rainbow Six lineup. Off Montreal teased the third echelon by Master in a video on Tuesday promising a full reveal on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern. So what's been the reaction from the community? Well, it's not the unconditional raving that Ubisoft might have been hoping for. Rainbow Six's subreddit was modestly enthusiastic, stoked by an in-world communique from the operator Finca to Rainbow Boss Harry Padney. Finca was saying this, it's strange seeing him after all these years. In some ways, not changed at all, but in others, staged well. Redditors immediately noted this isn't Michael Ironside's gravelly voice as the actor hasn't voiced Fisher in a Splinter Cell game since 2010's conviction. Ironside missed 2013's blacklist because he was diagnosed and receiving treatment for prostate cancer, but he did return to the role for a crossover event with Ghost Recon Wildlands in 2018. And YouTube commenters were a lot snarkier by saying, at this rate, Sam Fisher is going to be featured in every single Ubisoft game except its own. Raving Rabbids versus Sam Fisher DLC. Um, another said, you should know better than to write me off as Yubi does everything but make a new Splinter Cell game. And in seven years of Blacklist, Fisher has appeared in Wildlands and Ghost Breakpoint. And has been an Easter egg reference in the 2019 Division 2, as well as Far Cry's Fans have been expecting Fisher to show up in Siege since February when Ubisoft Montreal rolled out a five-year roadmap that showed one new character for the upcoming season three represented by a big old classified stamp. Subsequent leaks gave up Fisher's appearance well before Ubisoft announced the news. Season three will also get a rework of the skyscraper map plus the reasonable use of customary content in the works. The new content is expected to launch some. I agree with some of these con commenters that it just sounds like they're pumping out Sam Fisher in all this DLC. They're making him, you know, have a cameo in all these other games, but they're not giving him his own, which I think is just so strange. I have to agree completely on that because part of me is like, when are we getting the Sam Fisher game? When are we getting the Splinter Cell title? I mean, it just needs to be there. But when we actually take a look at all of the iterations that we've seen Sam Fisher, it feels like they're trying to like build towards this event, but it almost unintentionally seems to be rubbing people the wrong way. It does. I think a big part of that is that this isn't Michael Ironside's voice. And I think Sam Fisher is Michael Ironside's voice. I, I think they're, you know, one in the same. He did such a fantastic job. I think separating them 
is going to take away a lot of that hype and going to disappoint a lot of fans. Um, I hope, you know, he's still able to work. He's still healthy enough to, to work. I assume, you know, he, he wants to um, have this role again. I don't know why they would switch it up. You know, I feel like it seems pretty obvious that the community wants Michael Ironside to do the voice. They want a new, um, they want a new Splinter Cell game. I don't yeah. know why this is so complicated. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like the complication there is maybe that Ubisoft didn't realize there was this still this massive interest in this title. Uh, mm -hmm. They put it away and it, it just kind of makes it feel like when we when we sit down and take a look at uh, uh, Sam Fisher's journey, there just seems to be, to be this like point in time where they just stopped. They just kind of like abandoned it altogether. Yeah. It, it does. It seems like they just kind of dropped this game and kind of forgot about it. Um, I would, if there were a new Splinter Cell coming out, I would definitely play that game. I don't know what happened with it. If maybe, you know, the higher ups thought it wasn't a good investment or yeah. if there was, you know, so something like corporate that caused them to kind of forget about about Splinter Cell. But from a fan perspective, I don't see why. I don't, I don't think that it would be, you know, they... If they had a new Splinter Cell game, I don't think they would make it at a loss. I think it would be pretty profitable. Yeah, and that's just kind of where we're where we're at is that um, we are seeing the response from the community basically sitting there and saying like, "Hey, uh, you guys need to just give us the full game and stop putting forward these DLCs and these expansions." I mean, I played yeah. the 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 Breakpoint edition with Sam Fisher, and it was amazing. Like to hear Michael Ironside talk and to just kind of like see Sam as he's older but then i was like i want to play as sam you know what i mean right. i want sam's journey i don't want to i don't want to be passenger to sam i want to be sam what was that new game coming out for vr i remember you play oh, it yeah. looks kind of like sam fisher and he's in like a canoe and doing some like covert op stuff yeah. and i was like i think it's called Splinter covert Splinter? ops yeah, oh, really? yeah, yeah. yeah i think <laughs> wow, it is wow <laughs> that's so descriptive and you know i feel like i i guess if i'm not going to get another splinter cell i'm going to play these other games it's it's telling that they keep putting him in these games. They're putting, yeah. you know, Sam Fisher in Rainbow Six Siege. You know, I don't know why they just don't pull the trigger and give him his own game. Right. And maybe, uh, again, we're just going to sit here and wait for that big announcement that comes out on the full reveal or, or some other aspect of, of the, you know, Summer Games Fest or, or just somewhere along the line of Ubisoft talking about its titles and it'll just be like, hey, by the way, boom, new Splinter Cell game. If they don't do that, I feel like, it's gonna it's gonna be one of those things of like hey you guys want sam fisher people are like no i don't i don't want sam fisher i want him in his own game yes exactly don't don't give me sam fisher unless he's in his own game don't even talk to me unless no. sam fisher is in his own game yeah when i'm ready to to get back in there and and, and don that splinter cell status uh let me know otherwise i'll be over here playing non sam fisher dlc Oh, so sad. It really Just is. so super sad. It is. Well, I hope we're going to get news from Ubisoft. I hope maybe there is some Splinter Cell in the works that's just, you know, under wraps. As yeah. you said, maybe this is kind of a teaser, kind of lead up to the main event. Who knows? I hope we get an answer soon. Same. And uh, uh, an update that we did actually get regarding um, Star Citizen is one that I think was important because there was that feel that the Star, that Star Citizen gave like this roadmap for a roadmap. But now we've actually got a video which shows a new ship as well as Squadron 42's motion capture. And we've learned that the crowdfunding has passed a whopping $309 million dollars. That is so much money. Also, thank you so much for the subs in chat. Thanks so much, Skywalker. Hey, thank Thanks so much, everyone else who subbed earlier. So today, Star Citizen developer Cloud Imperium Games released a new video about the ever-growing space simulator. The video focuses initially on the newly revealed Asperia Talon ship, which is a fighter restored from an alien design that belonged to the Teveran alien race. So it comes in two variants. The standard version comes with big guns for a light fighter, while the Shrike version is equipped with lots of missiles. The ship will be flyable in December, and you can uh, it can be purchased starting at $90, with the usual caveat that you'll be able to simply grind credits to actually buy it in-game. The second part of the video brings to the table an interesting look at the motion and performance capture done for the game's single-player version, Squadron 42. And in other Star Citizen news, that crowdfunding total that we were talking about has reached precisely $309,337,574. <laughs> wow. 
with over 500,000 made in the past day or so. The number of registered accounts is now well over 2.7 million, currently 2,752,682. As usual, it's known that not all of them are paying players. The number includes free accounts created for a variety of reasons, including free fly events. Yeah, I think this is just a, one of a, those moments again to take in how much success Star Citizen has, has shown it's had to reach that amount of money. I mean, that's like a triple A title type budget for a game. But this also comes with the frustration that people have within this community that it's just kind of like, I still feel like I'm not getting the, the, the fullness of this game that I was told I'd be getting years ago. When I hear that the ship will be flyable in December, I'm like, will it be, though? <laughs> a lot of people have had their high hopes in this game. Nathaniel says, I wanted to be a part of Star Citizen when I was a kid, but you need to invest quite a bit. Um, I know some people that have spent, you know, quite a bit of money in this game. It's cool. They love it. But it's not finished. And it hasn't, you know, um, provided all of the elements of gameplay that is promised to people that have invested in this game. The last time we talked about Star Citizen, we were kind of joking about like, oh, where's all this money gone? This game has been in development for so long. You know, are, are people, are the execs spending it on like Lamborghinis, on like vacations to the Bahamas? Because it right. seems like it's not being invested into the game. Yeah, and that's the part where I think that the community is kind of, you know, now taking that stance on on being more vocal is what you guys, we can see how much money you've made. This is public, we right? It. We see it. And and there are individuals that are that are heavily dedicated to this community. Uh, we've had friends that have played it and you can see other people who stream it and it looks to be a lot of fun and it looks beautiful, but then it's just kind of like is it you know, is it just that beautiful outside with the empty inside? And that's not what should be happening with a game with this much money having been raised. Right. I think with this much money, they should have a clear end date of, you know, when the game is going to be done, or at least when major steps are going to be done. Um, when we last reported on this, you know, in addition to, you know, joking around about how the money was being spent, and um, we also read a <laughs> statement from the company that pretty much said, we have a plan to build a roadmap and then share with you that roadmap on a date. And it's like, so you're telling us your plan to make a plan yes. is that what's happening here like just tell us like are you making the game or not is this ever yeah. going to be finished right and that's where you hope it doesn't stay is in that limbo does it ever get finished um because that's not that's not too encouraging as anybody who no. backs this uh, i don't know if anybody in chat has backed star citizen has gotten a chance to play star citizen i see guff talking about it does look amazing and that that amount of money is like three times a triple a titles budget so, you know, for those who have gotten behind the game and those who have invested uh, and want to see, you know, Star Citizen succeed as a title, you know, in comparison to some of these other major ones, um, you would hopefully expect that the devs would be on the forefront of being transparent with their community as to the status, as to, like you were saying, these major moments in, in its roadmap and not just be like, we got this plan for a plan. And I don't want to encourage like crunch time culture or anything. I don't want to be like, this game needs to hurry up. You know, they need to they need to get this content out now. I'm just more of confused as what's happening on the state of the game because they've announced deadlines for themselves, missed those deadlines about when certain features are coming out, when Squadron 42 is, is coming out, you know, that's been pushed back a lot. And there just seems to be a lot of confusion on what are the plans for this game? What are concrete things that we can expect to see? And are those deadlines going to be missed again? Because because historically they happen. Yep, and we will be keeping our eyes on those hopeful updates from Star Citizen, that's right. And we will <laughs> uh, be informing you of them here on DGN, but an update we got actually from a uh, a previous kind of you know uh, news breakdown that we did regarding Remedy's titles that they have coming out is actually Remedy has come out and shared a little bit of information regarding Vanguard, its multiplayer game, as well as two unknown titles. Remedy shared its half-year financial review today, posting a 23% increased revenue compared to last year's period and 116% growth in operating profit. And so additionally, Remedy CEO Taro Vitarla uh, shared some very interesting statements on the status of the Finnish Studios' project, starting with the Vanguard multiplayer-focused one, which communications director Thomas Puha had briefly discussed in a previous interview, which was the interview we had been uh, uh, shared here on DGN a few days ago. So the CEO said the team working on Vanguard, a project also based on our own IP. Also, this doesn't have to do with Valorant, uh, the anti-cheat software, different right. Vanguard. Yes. So, so, so you know. 
<laughs> just so you know. So the team working on Vanguard, a project also based on our own IP, has taken the game's internally playable development version further, continuously evaluating, learning, and adjusting the development. Some parts of the game show very good promise. Some parts have been redesigned. We continue this iterative Vanguard development with a mission to combine long-term service-based multiplayer experiences with Remedy's unique game style. The game is developed with the Unreal 4 engine and the early phase work continues with a small team. And Remedy is also hard at work with two unannounced games that will be published by Epic Games. Vertala provided a brief update on both and even disclosed the finer terms of the publishing deal. Vertala said, our third unannounced project has proceeded well. We've also had an additional smaller scale project in development within the same franchise. Remedy had go several good publisher candidates for the projects and we chose to sign a publishing deal with Epic Games. They're the best fit for these games based on their experience as a developer, track record of expanding into new areas of gaming business and ambition to take game publishing to a new level. And then also uh, they went on to say, as the publisher, Epic covers development and marketing costs. And once these costs are recouped from the game sales, Remedy will receive 50% share of net revenue. And both projects are based on a game IP created and owned by Remedy. And we retain full creative freedom and ownership in this regard. I'm glad to see this in action because a few months ago we were actually talking about this and how Epic offered this, you know, to developers that yes. they would cover development costs, they would cover marketing costs, and, you know, developers would be able to keep their IP, which is something that is often unheard of, unfortunately. That is true. And that is great to see with a title uh, like, with, or sorry, with a studio like Remedy, that they are even, you know, honoring that knowing Remedy Games can net a very large profit. And they're still saying, hey, we'll do these deals with the small guys and the big guys, which I think is um, I think is very important for us to to take into our mental bank when it comes to Epic. And of course, in a little bit, we'll be talking about things surrounding Epic, because this is just one of those moments, again, where you see these bigger game studios like Remedy partnering up with Epic for this distribution deal. That is Remedy recognizing the the uh, community that Epic has access to, as well as the platform. Uh, being the right platform for them to debut these titles, which I believe are still wrapped up into this Alan Wake uh, universe, as so many have been rumored that it is a continuation of the Alan Wake story. Um, but also Remedy has said we have games in that cinematic universe. I'm also glad to see, you know, a, a bigger studio, you know, take on this deal with Epic. I think when I initially learned about, you know, this, um, this structure of working with Epic, it seems like it was catered to more towards smaller developers who maybe couldn't cover their costs, who maybe it was more risky for Epic to take on. Mm -hmm. But as you said, Remedy just knocks it out of the park. Like, I don't think this game is going to do poorly at all. I think it's going to be a success just, you know, based on their their past, especially with yeah. Control. Um, which was nominated for a lot of awards. Yeah. Um, even though this is a smaller team at Remedy, I, th I think they've got what it takes. I, I do too. And and we've seen it time and time again from from their titles. And I, something that Guff's saying in the chat is something that I think a lot of people are like, kind of not necessarily um, on the fence with Epic, but, and they might be, but more so of kind of like, is, is Epic's motivation behind their decision-making one that is consumer focused or is it business focused? And I think there's a lot to unravel there talking about what's going on with their lawsuit with with um, with uh, Epic. I mean, with Apple and now with with Google. But before we jump into that, there was a story that did come up that we felt like had some some worthiness to its time, which is very interesting as we've talked so much about next gen games and the need to be able to play those next gen games on previous gen titles, but we've actually heard from some developers that that's not that easy to do. So scaling back PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X games to original PlayStation 4 and Xbox One hardware is rather difficult for devs. Um, DF Slinneman says, former DICE engineer also confirms. So at least the Digital Foundry's John Linneman has said through Twitter overnight, uh, this information. So it's according to Lineman that plenty of developers have confirmed that scaling their upcoming cross-gen titles back to the base current gen hardware is rather a painful process. And as a matter of fact, Lineman states that the developers don't want to develop titles for the now underpowered AMD Jaguar CPU, which sits inside the base of all Sony PlayStation 4 
and Microsoft Xbox One uh, models, which was launched back in 2013. So Lindemann wrote on Twitter that nobody wants to develop for an underpowered Jaguar CPU any longer. Uh, he says, I've spoken with enough developers to know how painful the process is at this point. Leave Xbox One and PS4 behind. And Lindemann also tweeted this. One weird thing I've noticed lately is an aversion of next-gen exclusives as if launching a game exclusively for a next-gen machine is quote-unquote anti-consumer. And this is how it worked before. Mario 64 didn't exist on Super NES, and it was a great thing. Embark programmer and former software engineer at EA Dice, Lisa Shulyayeva, also chimed in on the matter and confirmed that developing games for several targets is rather hard indeed. According to the programmer, making titles work on both the current and next generation consoles requires a lot of work. This is what she wrote. She, she wrote this, building and certifying games for a bunch of targets is hard regardless of hardware utilization. Compatibility issues in the SDKs and other toolings are a thing, as are staffing and infrastructure limitations. This isn't a matter of clicking an extra button to support 10 platforms versus nine. Over the past few months, there have been several reports about the current gen consoles holding back the upcoming next gen consoles. Xbox head Phil Spencer, however, stated that this isn't the case with the Xbox. This is what Phil Spencer said. He said, yes, every developer is going to find a line and say that this is the hardware that I'm going to support. But the diversity of hardware choice in PC has not held back the highest fidelity PC games on the market. The highest fidelity PC games rival anything that anybody has ever seen in video games. So this idea that developers don't know how to build games or game engines or ecosystems that work across a set of hardware, there is a proof point in PC that shows that's not the case. So what do you think, chat? I agree with Waffle here that why have new gen if you have to hold back on the games? I think yeah. the whole point of getting, you know, a next gen console is to be able to play next gen games. Why else would you get one? You know, if you already yeah. have a PS4, just play your PS4 games on on there. But if you're going to get a PS5, you know, buy a game that's going to push those limits. I don't think there's a reason to, you know, make the new flashy, really complex games, you know, try to work on these older consoles. Yeah, I found it interesting that that Len uh, Lineman referenced old technology, right? Where mm -hmm. you have Phil Spencer come out and acknowledge the success of, of PCs and how he, he contrasts that Lineman approach. But anything that I've heard regarding the next gen technology is that it's it's like a hundred times better than what we currently have. So yeah. creating something big and then trying to scale it way down I, it already sounds like the foundation of these games are massive based mm -hmm. on the technology. And now you're like, I have to make this thing much smaller in, in comparison and get it to work on the previous gen consoles. I just don't want to put in that effort. No, not at all. And even when I have played, let's say I've played like a brand new game on my PC, which is now, you know, three something years old, like Doom Eternal, playing it on my PC, I had to scale all the settings way low, um, turn off like a lot of visual features on there and make it pretty much look like a potato to be able to play it. And it was still fun, but it wasn't the reason most people and not really the reason I bought Doom Eternal. Like I wanted right. to see the environment. I wanted to see how it all works. You know, I've just got to boot it up again on my next PC and actually, you know, take it in in its full glory. Yeah. But it's it's not the same experience anyway. Um, I, no. I know what he's saying by like on PCs, like technically you should be able to do this. But I think part of the appeal for me of consoles is that it's a dedicated gaming machine designed right. for gaming only nothing else. I don't need to like run Microsoft Excel on, on any of these <laughs> programs. I don't need to have like Spotify running and OBS and a capture card and a chat <laughs> log, you know, X, Y, Z, like right. games only. I, yep. I would, you know, I, I want these machines to be optimized for that. Yeah. That's, you know, that's where I, I get the, I want to be able to, you know, if I can't make the jump to the next gen, I, I want to be able to play these games. And and I understand that passion. I understand that desire. But when we look at the progress of technology and how fast it's it's happening, right? I mean, all of us recognize we are leaps and bounds what we were seven, eight years ago in, in technology. We can look at our phones, for example, and mm -hmm. see that directly, right? The difference between an iPhone 4 versus an iPhone 10 is leaps and bounds. So when we go, hey, I want the features that you have on the 10 on my 4, they're gonna be like, no, you're just gonna need to get a 10, no. right? Yeah. yeah. So I right. think we have to just kind of 
accept that going into the next gen that unfortunately part of this advancement is that you have to upgrade your hardware in order to get these experiences. I wonder how many consumers expect games, next gen games to be scaled back for their current consoles. That's not something I expect at all. Mm. Um, I don't know if this is a common thing that has just yeah. totally like gone over my head because this mm. is so not my sentiment. I think if you want to play the next gen games, get a next gen console. Um, you know, they, I, I thought Linneman made a good point with, you know, the Super NES, which yeah. we just covered yesterday and how Super Mario World, you needed, you needed the SNES to play that because you wouldn't be able to have Mario and Yoshi together on the old console. You needed the new console to actually make the game work. Yeah, and and to to Philip's comment there, uh, which I think is the is more of a concern. I think this is one of those situations of like, what's the what's the real concerns behind you know next gen? And I think more of it is I just want to make sure that all these games I've compiled, especially a lot of these digital ones, I can just mm -hmm. use on the next gen and it not be an issue. And I think these developers are well aware of that and are working hard to ensure that that be. Uh, the case that you don't transfer over to the next gen and you've basically lost possibly hundreds of dollars on things you've spent in the past. So, you know, I want to actually hear more on that. I want to see Sony mm -hmm. come out and Xbox come out and show their hardware doing just this, running previous gen games. So individuals like Philip and I'm sure others out there that might be watching or, or, or just in the market for the next gen hardware are reassured that they're not going to suffer this loss. I, I do think that's the bigger concern as well. You know, you don't want to lose your old games. You want to make sure that you'll be able to play them, that you don't have to, you know, keep your OG Xbox in your attic right. for, for every now and then <laughs> when you want to, like, break out Fable on, yeah. on disc. You know, I like to have that update with the times. And we've heard that it's kind of a painstaking process to make some of these consoles backwards compatible or, or to run some of these games. You know, it's not just you can boot it up. It's a more powerful system. So of course it can run this older game. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, but I do think that it matters a lot to consumers. People get really angry when they don't have backwards compatibility. And I think it's something that gamers are gonna be really stubborn on and aren't gonna budge on, you know, in the future. Yeah, that's very true. And one that I think we see when we pay attention to what Xbox is doing with the Game Pass, as well as what Sony does with its PlayStation Now service is they know that this is a this is a concern and could be, you know, a deciding factor of whether or not they jump uh, into that next gen hardware. Should we get into this Epic Games news? We should, because I think this is huge as a lot has transpired since yesterday's event with it being taken down from Apple stores. Now Google's in the mix. So we're going to dive through r report and break it down and then also going to show off that that troll that Epic put out with that 1984-style oh ad aimed at Apple. So the next um, the next step in this saga is that game developer and publisher Epic Games has filed a lawsuit against Apple following the removal of the iOS version of its Battle Royale game Fortnite from the App Store earlier today. Earlier, yes, yesterday. late yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Late yesterday. So the legal complaint filed in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California seeks to establish Apple's App Store as a monopoly and that the civil suit is seeking injunctive relief to quote-unquote allow fair competition in the mobile app distribution. Epic effectively provoked Apple's removal of Fortnite earlier um, yesterday when it implemented its own payment processing system into the iOS version of the Battle Royale, hit an apparent violation of Apple's App Store guidelines. And so the complaint read as this, Epic brings this suit to end Apple's unfair and anti-competitive actions that Apple undertakes to unlawfully maintain its monopoly in two distinct multi-billion dollar ma markets. One, the iOS app distribution market, and two, the iOS in-app payment processing market. It goes on to say Epic is not seeking monetary compensation from this court for the injuries it has suffered, nor is Epic seeking a favorable treatment for itself, a single company. Instead, Epic is seeking injunctive relief to allow fair competition in these two key markets that directly affect hundreds of millions of consumers and tens of thousands, if not more, of third-party app developers. Uh, thank you so much for the donation, Kai. We really, really thank appreciate you. it. So these are Epic's primary claims in support of the argument of Apple violating its U.S. antitrust law. 
It starts with Apple unlawfully maintains its monopoly power in the iOS app distribution market through the anti-competitive acts described herein, including by imposing technical and contractual restrictions on iOS, which prevents the distribution of iOS apps through means other than the App Store and prevents developers from distributing competing app stores to iOS users. More of that claim states this, Apple has unlawfully maintained its monopoly power in the iOS app distribution market through its unlawful denial to Epic and other app distributors of an essential facility access to the iOS, which prevents them from competing in the iOS app distribution market. Furthermore, it states to reach iOS users, Apple forces developers to agree to Apple's unlawful terms contained in its developer agreement and to comply with Apple's App Store review guidelines, including the requirement iOS developers distribute their apps through the App Store. These contractual provisions unlawfully foreclose the iOS app distribution market to competitors and maintain Apple's monopoly. Hey, Cassie, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the DGN family. We are diving into this claim uh, from Epic regarding the Apple lawsuit. Apple, uh, um, Epic continues to say this, um, to reach iOS users, Apple forces developers to agree to Apple's unlawful terms contained in its developer agreement to comply with the Apple's App Store, review guidelines including that require developers to distribute their apps through the App Store, and these contractual provisions unlawfully foreclose the iOS app distribution market to competitors and maintain Apple's monopoly. Um, and it, it continues to say that Apple has unlawfully maintained its monopoly in these markets through the anti-competitive acts alleged, including by forcing through its contractual terms and unlawful policies, iOS app developers that sell in-app content to exclusively use Apple's in-app purchase and preventing and discouraging app developers from developing or integrating alternative payment processing solutions. And, and something Guff just said there as we were reading this out, this feels... Like they knew this was coming. I mean, yeah, they this were is so prepared uh, and it was released very fast. So it, it, it goes on to end uh, in, in two paragraphs. It says this, it says to reach iOS app users, Apple forces developers to agree to Apple's unlawful terms contained in its developer agreement, including that they use Apple's in-app purchases for in-app purchases of an in-app content to the exclusion of any alternative solution or third-party payment processor. Further, Section 3.13 of Apple's App Store Review Guidelines unlawfully prohibits developers from directly or indirectly targeting iOS users to use purchasing methods other than in-app purchase. And the statement finishes with Apple is able to unlawfully condition access to the App Store on the developer's use of a second product, in-app purchase, for in-app sales of in-app content. Through its developer agreement and unlawful policies, Apple expressly conditions the use of its App Store on the use of its in-app purchase to the exclusion of alternative solutions in a per se unlawful tying arrangement. So Epic is alleging that Apple has a monopoly in the form of the iPhone and the iOS ecosystem and the App Store that binds them together, and that Apple places unreasonable restrictions on the distribution of iOS apps. Again, the only way to get software onto the iPhone or iPad is through this, so that's why the complaint is also alleging that Apple places unreasonable restrictions on payment processing within these iOS apps. What's up, Buckle? I do encourage you all, if you want to get a second look at this, to you know, look, uh, go to the Verge's website, you know, read this article for yourself because there is a lot of jargon here, a lot of branded jargon to say in-app purchase, the app store, the iOS, the iPhone, the in-app sales of the in-app content of the in-app purchase. And it's just kind of a whole mouthful yeah. um, to process as well. So Epic doesn't take issue with the fact that Apple requires developers to use the app store. Rather, the game studio thinks it's unfair. Apple requires you to use its payment methods, which thereby gives Apple 30% of all in-app revenue of, on the digital goods that make up the entirety of Fortnite's business model. And so what's important to take out of here is that Epic, in its complaint, is leaning heavily on the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, a monumental piece of antitrust legislation in the U.S. that is used to break up monopolies, and it was during the turn of the 20th century. And it remains the pillar of the U.S. antitrust law, and, Apple claims, and Epic claims that Apple has violated six separate accounts of the Sherman Antitrust Act an unlawful monopoly in the form of the App Store, denial of a central facility in iOS app distribution, unreasonable restraints of trade in iOS app distribution, and then similar counts for in-app payment processing on iOS. 
The final count referencing the Sherman Act is over Apple tying the App Store in the iOS app distribution market to in-app purchase in the iOS in-app payment processing market, effectively creating what Epic sees as a monopoly, harming competition and causing harm to consumers through inflated pricing. The complaint also accuses Apple of three counts of violating the California Cartwright Act, which is a state antitrust law prohibiting price fixing and trade restraint agreements, and one count of violating California unfair competition. Law. So uh, Epic is able to make the pricing argument because it specifically lowered prices on its in-game Fortnite currency when it implemented its own payment processing system, saying it was passing the savings on to consumers and what is now a clear ploy to paint Apple's decisions as anti-consumer. The complaint explains, in other words, app developers are coerced into using in-app purchase by virtue of wanting to use the App Store. Apple's unlawful tying arrangement thus ties two separate products that are in separate markets and coerces Epic and other developers to rely on both of Apple's products. And again, that's the in-app purchase and that is the App Store. Yeah, so Epic is saying this, Epic has been harmed by Apple's anti-competitive conduct in a manner that the antitrust laws were intended to prevent. Epic has suffered and continues to suffer harm and irreparable injury, and such harm and injury will not abate until an injunction ending Apple's anti-competitive conduct issues. And the story doesn't end here because now Google is in the <laughs> conversation. So as with Apple, Google requires that games use the Google Play system for in-app purchases. Although the Play Store's rules are somewhat more lax than Apple's when it comes to in-app purchases, Google does draw the line at games and it's quite clear cut. Developers offering products within a game downloaded on Google Play or providing access to game content must use Google Play in-app billing as the method of payment. Google's system also takes a 30% cut just as Apple does. And it seems like it does the same thing of tying in app billing to, you know, distribution via the Play Store. Yeah, and Epic's update earlier today ran afoul on that rule. And while Google took longer to make a decision to ban Fortnite over it than Apple, both companies have reached the same conclusion. Google's statement says, the open Android ecosystem lets developers distribute apps through multiple app stores. For game developers who choose to use the Play Store, they don't really have a choice here if they want to use Google. Um, they said, for, for game developers who choose to use the Play Store, we have consistent policies that are fair to developers and keep the store safe for users. While Fortnite remains available on Android, we can no longer make it available on Play because it violates our policies. However, we welcome the opportunity to continue our discussions with Epic and bring Fortnite back into Google Play. A Google spokesperson emphasized that Android is an open ecosystem that allows multiple stores and that Google Play's policies needed to apply equally to all developers. And it has no problem with those other stores existing, nor with Epic distributing its game on them, the spokesperson said. So you can still install Fortnite on Android. Epic itself points visitors to its website where they can either download Fortnite through the Epic Games app or via the Samsung Galaxy Store on Samsung devices. This is different from iPhone and iPad where it's now impossible to install the game if you haven't already done so. And given Epic's outsized response to Apple's ban with this lawsuit and the 1984 ad which we're about to show, it's a sure bet and I think we're all expecting that there's gonna be a response to Google as well. Oh, totally. So Epic decided to mock Apple's most iconic ad ever as revenge, possible revenge. I think it's very clearly revenge on Fortnite's App Store ban. So let's go ahead and, and show this. Uh, this is so funny and I give, I give Epic a lot of credit for the creativity and the trollish nature of this, but here is the ad in its entirety. It's like shot for shot. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag
hashtag free free Fortnite. Fortnite. Oh my god. Okay, I gotta agree so much there with Charmer. Best remake if of that ad that I've ever seen. It's so good. Oh my god. <laughs> it's so good. Absolute best remake. They hit the nail on the head. I thought the free Fortnite hashtag was a meme at first. I've kind of seen it floating around and I thought it was kind of the same as like free Britney, you know, free, free whoever is relevant right now, free right. Fortnite, whatever. I didn't realize Epic actually, you know, co-signed this hashtag. Yeah. It is great. And so we have to remember that the original advertisement was directed by Ridley Scott and it portrayed Apple and the Macintosh as this rebellious upstart willing to challenge the status quo with the tagline, you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Referencing the classic dystopian novel by George Orwell, where the world is ruled by totalitarian super states and freedom of thought is forbidden. So presumably Epic's new short will reverse that position and portray Apple and App Store policies as the oppressive regime in need of a shock to its system now. This is just a huge story to unpack. I wow. think that this was in the works for a long time. Yes. You know, that congressional hearing about, you know, these companies oh, yeah. and monopolies. It seems like this <laughs> ad remake was, you know, set up way ahead of time. It seems like Fortnite and Epic really strategically chose to, you know, make its new um, in-app purchasing system of V-Bucks you know, a, a thing knowing it would get banned from the app store, as you said, and now they have a response to it. You know, Epic has seen like six steps ahead. <laughs> right, yeah, I feel like they were like, hey guys, uh, do you notice this 30% cut thing that keeps happening? Like we don't have any other choice around this. We're a free to play game. Uh, that 30% should go towards the consumers. It shouldn't necessarily go towards Apple. We lose more of a cut. And I'm sure they were like, well, we're gonna make that change and let's let's go around it. What is probably gonna happen? Oh, we might we might have some resistance. They might ban. So how do we respond? They have very well. This has been a very well thought out process because it's happened so fast. This ad that takes Absolutely. time. So it's not, just so fast. Yeah, editing a, an ad like that isn't like an overnight thing. So no. someone somewhere was already working on that to portray Apple in that way. And once they were ready, they probably just threw up the text at the end and were like, "It happened. Here we go." I'm like, who are Epic's lawyers? If I'm ever in trouble, like I've got to get them on my team. They really know <laughs> stuff. Um, someone mentioned, well, you can still, you know, download um, Fortnite on Android. So you can, but we reported in the past that it's they it's made difficult on purpose yeah. and the phone will flag it as like, oh, are you sure you want to download this? Yeah. It might be malware. Like, you know, and you have to do security settings and it's, you know, kind of a laborious process. It's yeah. not very easy. It's not like a one click. So technically you can do it. I don't know if that's going to be Google's like loophole, right. but I think still, you know, tying the in-app purchases, you know, to the actual um, play store, it seems where Epic is, you know, really honing in on. Very much so. And, and, and uh, Epic themselves are saying, if you've got a Samsung, use the Samsung store because we're still up on there. If you have an Android, use that store. You can still get it, which is really interesting because Samsung hasn't like, they're like, nah, don't, don't. We're not, we're not included <laughs> we're in not this. Messing. Yeah, we're just, yeah, we got it there. We've got our own store and everything. One of the interesting things about this that I've been, I've been catching up on is there's a huge response from the gaming industry, specifically developers and high ups where individuals like mm -hmm. Gabe Newell have come out in support of epic in this wow. uh situation and are 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 pushing this this narrative that when you look at what apple's policies are as it's broken down by the antitrust law they do fall into this monopolistic practice and someone said earlier well isn't you know ios apple's own ip isn't that their own thing i think you know why this is kind of a different issue is because now Apple and iPhone has so much of the phone market overall. Yeah. And after that, you know, now they're controlling, you know, how, how apps can be on that. So maybe if it's a more like niche thing where, where getting an iPhone is very niche, you know, it has its own set of rules, like sure. But since, you know, Apple takes up so much of the market, I think now that's why it gets into monopoly area is yeah. one of the many reasons. It's like if a place owns the land, the property itself, and is selling the items inside the property that you come in there to buy, and it's taking a cut on all of those things. This is what you're kind of seeing and why you see Epic pushing back on this uh, you probably are getting Google's response because Google's looks to be doing the same thing. And it, it, like you mentioned that that hearing, both Tim uh, Cook and the, Tim, the Apple. Head, Tim Apple, I wanted to say that so badly. It's so funny. Uh, Tim Cook and uh, the, the, the guy who's the CEO for, for Google, uh, mm -hmm. they both 
were called on to the stand to talk about these things and address you know some of these issues that people have have acknowledged with them so i think what we're kind of seeing now like we were saying yesterday is these bigger places like epic which is a 17.3 billion dollar company um they're not standing for it and they're calling it out I love how it's not just me. It's like no one knows the name of Google CEO. I just yeah. looked it up and it's Sundar Pichai, I That's believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pichai. Um, everyone knows like Twitter, you know, Jack Dorsey, Facebook, yeah. Zuckerberg, you know, like Tim Sweeney, you know, Tim Cook of, of Apple. But like yeah. Google CEO, no idea. <laughs> yeah, there's not really like a public presence. And then you also have to realize like, it's not just Google, it's Alphabet, the company behind Google, which yeah. is not a lot of people know. You were like, what? I just thought it was no. Google. I was like, no, there's a parent company there that that, right. that has a lot to say in this too. You know, this is a very particular timing. I, I think Epic has been waiting on this move for a while. I really wonder what's going to happen here, um, especially because, you know, Congress seems to be taking a hard look at monopolies. I yes. think without that hearing, this might seem kind of out of That's the blue. That's a good point. That's a really would, good point. Yeah, it wouldn't seem warranted if this just like came out on its own. I don't right. Know. Yeah, I think that it, that had something to do with this. Either either Epic realized this was now the time to call it out. It's being it's being addressed. It's in the spotlight. You know what I mean? Like there there's mm -hmm. something a, behind that that I I completely agree with you on. That like you were saying, Epic's law firm is a law firm we all want because we know they <laughs> yeah. were like, hey guys, are you ready? We're doing this. Now's the time. <laughs> Now's the time. Yeah, I I wonder what consumers think. It seems like a lot of kids are siding with Fortnite and of Epic course. Games, which of course, of course which right? I don't know if that means anything to you know the law uh, to have a bunch of people you know trending the free Fortnite hashtag. I don't think Apple's right. going to be scared of that. I wouldn't be scared of that if Fortnite came at me saying like hashtag free Fortnite. I'd be like, stop using hashtags. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. let's, let's <laughs> be adults about this. <laughs> um, hilarious. I, yeah. Um, I want to know, I'm now going to pull a clip from this and then post the clip and just be like, hashtag free Fortnite. Hashtag free Fortnite. That's it. You know, DGN today, just hashtag free Fortnite. Um, it, this is a big move. I think also these monopolies have slowly and slowly crept up on us that I think, you know, now I'm turning around and be like, oh yeah, like a lot of phones are Apple. You know, this is a monopoly. This is strong arming consumers. I mentioned, I think yesterday that um, it might be, you know, Apple's app store that has really contributed to this kind of spammy idea of mobile games because they rely on micro microtransactions and because maybe they need, you know, a lot of money to be spent or maybe more microtransactions because Apple takes such a big cut, um, you know, and oh, it's wow. kind of tarnished, you know, part of the, you know, mobile gaming industry because yeah. I see it as something that's just like, a waste of money a lot of the time. Yeah, that's another really good observation that that part of the the influx of microtransactions have come from these places that are housing, you know, these games and the game developers are like, well, I have to make more money because I'm yeah. kicking out so much more just to Apple because of their policies for housing my game. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder what Apple's going to do next. Who knows? I hope this is going to be a big public case because I definitely want to keep following this. Yeah, I'm going to make a, a reference to an old show that during a time period like this, I, I miss the existence of shows like uh, Celebrity Deathmatch because I think this oh. would be the fight between uh, uh, Tim Sweeney versus Tim Cook and we would yes. see the showdown happen in the ring. Uh, I'm just envisioning it right now. The Battle of the Tims. Ah, Celebrity Deathmatch, where are you? Yo, the Battle of the Tims. We need to make it happen. We we need to see what's going to come of this. Uh, yeah. Meg makes a good point. Or the games have just so many ads to try to make money. And it's just, it's worsening the product. And the whole point of competition is so the consumer ends up getting the best product. Ideally, you know, if a lot of companies are competing, then you don't have those spammy ads. Then you don't have all these, you know, spammy microtransactions that you actually have a good product that actually ends up being the best for the consumer. And at least I've seen right now that the app store is not what's best for the consumer at all. I don't use the Play Store. I don't know, you know, in chat what you think about that. But I think that does show that this is kind of a monopoly if there's no competition. <laughs> Good, good whisper. Good, Thanks. Good whisper there. Being they very didn't, secretive about they it. They didn't hear us. They, they didn't, didn't hear, hear us. Don't tell anyone. So as we keep our eye on what happens with Apple and Google and Epic Games, uh, make sure to tune into DG, DGN to get all the latest surrounding that. But let's talk about something that seems really cool and I think is also a very fun approach to storytelling and to give uh, uh, consumers and fans of 
the particular IP, specifically Assassin's Creed, is that there is a graphic novel coming out based on uh, El- a- Eivor's backstory. So Assassin's Creed Valhalla is getting an official prequel graphic novel from Dark Horse called Assassin's Creed Valhalla Song of Glory, and it'll dive deep into Ivor's backstory. So the three-part graphic novel takes place prior to Valhalla and is considered an official prequel due out for the collection in a hardcover April 2021, and it will retail for $17.99. The female Eivor is the canonical canonical, uh, hero in this Assassin's Creed Valhalla prequel, and she has a brother named Sigurd who will play a crucial role in the story. The description on the Penguin Random House listing goes into great detail about the graphic novel's plot. Potential spoilers, please mute if you don't want to hear anything about what happens in this graphic novel. So tensions escalate when a village caught between two rival kingdoms is brutally raided. Ivor, warrior and daughter of wise King Stribjorn, dispatches the raiders, rescues the villagers, and claims the settlement for her father. She also seizes a prisoner, a woman, Gull, left behind by the rivals, who declares she possesses the secrets of Asgard itself. But there is more to Gull than meets the eye and her capture will bring death and destruction to Ivor's family. It goes on saying, in disgrace and lured by the promise of treasures and glory, Eivor undergoes a dangerous quest to regain her honor. But what terror awaits in the forgotten temple of a powerful god? All the time, her brother Sigurd forges his own legend while searching for fortune in the lands of the east. Far from home, he finds new weapons in a fresh plunder, making a discovery that will change his destiny forever. So does this mean we'll get to meet Sigurd in Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Did he head east to meet other assassins? You know, is he going to be on the cover of the novel? Is this prequel going to detail, you know, the supernatural element at play in the game? Um, Are a lot of you in chat interested in this? And, you know, also having a graphic novel to accompany um, your copy of Assassin's Creed Valhalla? I think that this is cool. I like this. I do too. This is like the, the, the feel of the TTRPG for Cyberpunk 2077. If you want, there's one in that, you know, regard to learn more about the world uh, that you will be constantly in and playing around in. And I think this is huge for Assassin's Creed Valhalla because we know there is so much story surrounding this game that's based on uh, real historical events. um, Mm -hmm. And they also take a lot of actual historical facts and include it in this game that I think the journey isn't going to be as, you know, satiated in just one playthrough that for those who really want to dive deep into the lore, they can go and grab this graphic novel and get this fuller understanding of the world that it is they're playing in. I love this because there are so many games that I've played where I've just been left wanting more. I'm like, that's a whole story. Like, that's all I get. Like, that's all there is to it. it. And I think that's it. Um, I think this is a cool addition. Um, So the... The graphic novel will um, will be out in April 2021, so that's going to be after the game launches. But if you're still wanting more, you know, you'll be able to get this prequel. Um, the art already looks great from what I've seen. Um, I think this is a you know a great addition to any video game player's collection. I do too. It is a choice that I would love to see all developers start to make when it comes to their intellectual properties, and especially when you have a big story like what we know Assassin's Creed games can can uh, uh, reach. You, you want to have some that, you know, fill in the gaps or there's going to be questions that are unanswered. And a lot of us right now with our free time are going to be like, hey, I need some more information. Well, you're going to have to wait till April of next year before you get more. And it's like, what now? Right now, I guess I'll have to replay Assassin's Creed Valhalla again right. um, before I get there. Right. But it's sure. And I'm really looking forward to this game. It's funny, too, because, like, Guff's comment, it doesn't work for every game, which is true, because, like, true. if you think of a game like Fall Guys, there's no graphic novel for Fall Guys, even though that would be pretty funny uh, if that did exist. I need the lore for Fall Guys. I need the I need the sorrowful backstory. I need I need more information on the sorcery and the prisoners captured. Well, there is more information that I can give you, Kaiza, in regards to Fall Guys, is that there is free content coming out for Fall Guys, and this has been confirmed by Media Tonic. What? what? So Fall Guys will be running competitive seasons as part of its post-launch roadmap. Mediatonic has confirmed. Speaking to Games Radar earlier this month, lead designer Joe Walsh explained that each session is each season is going to come with a batch of new levels, basically that we're going to add to the pile. So alongside that, he says we're going to be adding like new costumes and new things to unlock. So every now and then the game is going to get injected with a bunch of free content. 
He says the joy of Fall Guys comes from not knowing what you're going to be doing next. And that is something that will just get better and better the more rounds that we put in. And then he goes on to say that with 25 people at Mediatonic, they are already, there are already levels that we forgot about. And then you're like, oh my God, I totally forgot that this even existed. And the more that we can push as like the season rolls on, we have more and more content. It just means the better. Walsh also promised that Mediatonic is listening to the community about highly requested features like squads mode and crossplay, which are hopefully not too far off the horizon for the already hugely popular Battle Royale. I love uh, the, the spirit of this game. What they've done with the Battle Royale uh, uh, medium and their take on it and how rewarding of an experience Fall Guys is and seeing all these popular streamers playing it too, like people who are like, it's Call of Duty, it's Valorant, it's all this shooting. And they're like, fall guys, I tumble and fall. I'm trying to jump on this platform in the seesaw. It's so great to see this in existence. It's great. And it's magical that this is a battle royale. Because <laughs> yes. when we've been talking about battle royales, we're like, oh, the market is so saturated. You know, Warzone, Fortnite, um, Danger Zone, you know, all these different battle royales. And Fall Guys comes in here and is like, nah, like, you don't know battle royales. Like, we're going to do a battle royale. We're going to give you the most wholesome battle royale possible. And and funny, too, with the conversation regarding, like, the hackers in Fall Guys and how they've addressed it. And there's also been some server issues as well. Uh, there was some commentary that I remember reading that which was like, we should expect uh, for Fall Guys players, there should there will be some sort of like gift for dealing with the these aspects of, of the game, unfortunately. I appreciate that a lot. It seems like the developers are working really hard, you know, to crack down on cheating. It seems like they've kind of already got it figured out. Yeah. Um, according to a tweet, they're just like, yeah, you don't need to report anything. Like we can we can see where the hackers are like, cool. And it's like, yeah. wow, I don't expect that from games anymore. No, I don't. You know, games that make billions of dollars can't even do this, but you guys no. are doing it with that 25 person team. I, I love Charmer's comment, more rage playing. It's so funny watching people play Fall Guys and seeing the moments of like, I'm going to do this thing and then it doesn't work and then they get upset because just getting upset and raging while playing Fall Guys, it's just a stark contrast, but it is also very humorous to, to witness. It is. I've been seeing also, you know, mock skins from like KFC or like a lot of brands about Fall Guys. And I wonder if anything's going to happen with that, if Fall Guys is going to introduce these skins or if they're going to be like, no, we're not going corporate. Like this is just going to be more fun. Mm, interesting. I hope... Oh. You're, I hope we're on the side. It doesn't go more co corporate. I do just want to acknowledge shots fired in the chat from Coombs. As Coombs says, Fall Guys is a better BR than Warzone. Fighting <laughs> words. Warzone words. players be hurt. Requires more skill than Warzone. I should go and tell people that. Actually, Fall Guys requires more skill, so... Who's the premier gamer here? That's a great point. And, 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 and Mr. MFA was saying this, that... And we've seen these videos. There has been a spike of hackers while playing this game. There isn't a purpose in hacking in this game. No. We don't we don't know. I think there are a lot of people that have been like, Fall Guys? Hacking in Fall Guys? What? What? What is wrong with you? You hack in Fall Guys, you go straight to hell right away. That's how it works. Correct. That's how it works. <laughs> you get on a bullet train, you get on a private jet right there. Get down. But this is get down. this is just one of those one of those games that I think it's it's struck that universal chord in most gamers is that you can have this casual pick up and play, rewarding, fun, hilarious battle royale experience and not feel the intensity and pressure of a shooter, yeah. you know, like Warzone uh, um, or any of these other ones like PUBG. And, and also now that there are hackers, you're kind of like, I thought I could escape the hacking, but I think right now we're just gonna accept that 2020 is the year of hacking. 2020 is a tough year. If you stick through the hacking, you're a real trooper. Um, so what will you be playing this weekend? Since that it's the start of the weekend. is a great question. As for some games to be playing this weekend, on my end is most likely more Warzone, as that's been the case. But there are some ones that have come out that have caught our eye, like Hyperscape, which is another Battle Royale, which takes a little bit of a, a fresh take on it, which released on August 11th. And also a game that I did a PowerPoint presentation on. Some of you may remember the game, Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? <laughs> is out on PC, PS4, and Switch. And it's a dungeon cr crawler and date simulator. What a name. What a name. 
Um, another game that, that came out on August 12th is a game called Metamorphosis, which is available on PC, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch. And that's based on the Kafka um, novella about, yeah. you know, Gregor Mendel becoming a cockroach. And, you know, it's a very, like, quirky kind of story game. If anyone was a fan of that or if anyone was forced to read that in English class, um, <laughs> you can finally, you know, play through it. There's also um, UFC 4 just yeah. came out August 14th. Yeah, I wonder when the Fight Island DLC will come yes. out. And we'll get the representation of Dana White as Mr. White, a.k.a. M. Bison's, you know, look and feel. They got to they got to do that. I need to see Dana White as the villain of UFC four. Like that's the campaign story mode is he's like, I've called all these fighters to my island. Right. Will be here fighting for your freedom. He's the final boss there. But that does bring us to the end of daily gaming news for today. Thank you for joining us on this Friday with this wild news about Epic Games, you know, touching more on Sam Fisher. Hopefully we're going to finally get a game um, of Splinter Cell and all the other news that we touched on. Yes, and was another week for daily gaming news. I saw someone comment earlier in, in the, the hour was like, wow, it's been a month of, of subs already. It has been a month and it's been a great month. It and has. We are not able to do this without all of you amazing beautiful members of the dgn family so for everybody liking following subscribing thank you so much this is not possible without your existence and your support and we'll be posting these vods on youtube you can also catch them on twitch if you're watching a vod we are live from 1 to 2 p.m every weekday so we're going to be back on monday and don't forget to subscribe like follow retweet link if you have any messages for us exclamation point mailbag will bring up a submission form if you want to send any questions topics suggestions of things you want us to cover or things you'd like to see in the show and we do have some stuff that we do uh each week new segments on monday we'll do an esports roundup on thursday we'll be doing our throwback on this day in gaming and then we are going to start doing interviews with game developers as we have our first interview booked for next week so be on the lookout for that definitely be on the lookout some of you will be very excited to see this person on the stream some of you already know who they are um or know of them it's not been announced there are no leaks here no leaks um, no leaks Maron and i are good at not leaking information um but for today that is daily giving news thank you so much for joining us i am kaisa i am Maron. we appreciate you all dgn fam we'll see you next time see ya